So, quickly, I want to get into the message. I don't want to waste any more time. This week, uh, we continue in our series on Israel in the end times. Last week, if you missed last week, Pastor Weaver talked about Israel, giving a historical context to what's going on there, uh, what has happened uh, over time in the land of Israel and with the people of Israel over all of these thousands of years since God called Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and made a covenant with him. God's promise uh, was to give him land and to make him into a great nation. And the Bible tells us that it was a lasting covenant to be forever. Genesis chapter 17 verse 7 and 8 says, I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you. This is to Abraham from generation to generation. This is the everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And I will give you the entire land of Canaan where you now live as a foreigner to you and to your descendants. It will be their possession forever and I will be their God. This is a covenant between God and his people and it's a lasting covenant. And since that time there has been conflict. There has been persecution in that area of the world ever since. The Middle East. Israel being attacked by, uh, through the Bible we see the Egyptians, the Amalekites, the Midianites, the Amorites, the Moabites, the Philistines, the Syrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Romans, and you know all of the current history over the last 2,000 years, and of course bringing us up into uh, the, uh, the Nazis in 1940, the 1940s. Israel gets a lot of attention and a lot of negative attention. And here's what I want to say. The nation of Israel has always experienced persecution because Satan hates the agenda of God. And he is always working against the agenda. Israel, from the beginning, has been part of that agenda. So I want you to turn this morning. We're going to be looking at some of the signs of the times that we're living in and what Jesus talked about in Scripture. So turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. <laughs> Sounds like the World Series. <laughs> Who was that team that won? Anybody a fan? <laughs> Anybody a fan of God's Word? We love God's Word. Amen. Let me read starting in, Gen- in Matthew chapter 24, verse 3. Later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and said, tell us, when will all this happen? What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? And Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah, and they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world, but all of this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. But, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it, and then the end will come. I want to jump ahead from millennia ago to uh, something current, but still a few years ago. It was October of 1982. Some of you weren't even alive then, which is crazy for me to think. October 1982, Badger Stadium in Madison, Wisconsin. I don't know if we have any Badger fans here, um, but you're probably not going to say it if you are. (laughs) 60,000 people had uh, come into Badger Stadium uh, to cheer for their beloved Wisconsin Badgers against Michigan State. What seemed odd on that afternoon in October of 1982 is that when their team wasn't doing so well, it seemed that there were more cheers and applause going on in the stands. And there were people who began to wonder, what and who are these strange people who are cheering when their team seems to be losing? As it turns out, 70 miles from Badger Stadium, the Milwaukee Brewers 
were beating the St. Louis Cardinals in game three of the World Series that year. Many of the Badger fans in the stands were listening to portable radios. (laughs) Portable radios, they were these little things that uh, got radio signals. You know, yesterday the Hawkeyes game was on Peacock. I'm sitting down to pull up the game and it's on Peacock. I don't subscribe to Peacock. Why can't my my phone be a radio? I can't even listen to the game through any of my devices. I have to pull out the old radio. The only radio I have is in my car. So guess who didn't get the Hawkeyes game yesterday? Me and a few other people, I think. So here they were. They were responding to something other than what was happening right before them, right before their very eyes. And I think in many ways that's a depiction of what the the Christian life is like. Even though we look around at the world around us and we see the injustice, we see the pain, we see the heartache that's all around us, we know a different voice that tells us that we have something to hope for in the midst of everything that's going on. We have something to look forward to. And actually the world thinks we're weird. How can, with all the trouble that's going on in the world, how can these people be happy? What are you so happy about? We know the rest of the story. There is something for us to hope about. And so as we look at the signs of Jesus' return and of the end of the earth as we know it, uh, maybe you are filled with a little bit of fear, with a little bit of grief and anxiety, knowing what's coming, not knowing what's coming, how is this all going to work out, la da da You know the story. I hope that today you will just dispel of all that fear. We may see where our culture is going, but we know what God's word says. We have a future of heaven, a perfect place, and that's what I'm looking forward to. So Jesus, when he left earth, back in Acts chapter 1, Jesus left. He had given his disciples, he said, you will receive the, 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 the Holy Spirit will come on you and you will receive power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then it goes on after that verse in Acts 1-8 to say this, after this he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching and they could no longer see him. And as they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way that you saw him go. We are looking forward to Jesus' return. Jesus told his disciples in John 14, he knew he was getting ready to, uh, uh, to go to the cross. He knew that he was going to be going to heaven. And he says, said to his disciples in John 14, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe God, believe also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's home. More than enough room. Many mansions, some versions say. Many rooms. He said, if it wasn't so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back to receive you, to be with me so that you can forever be with me where I am. That's great to know that he's preparing a place for us that we've got an eternal heaven waiting for us. He said, you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas said, no, Lord, we don't know the way, so how can we know where where to go? And he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I want to skip ahead to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. These are a few verses that aren't on the screens, but if you're taking notes, write them down. Of Jesus' return. This is what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5 concerning how and when all this will happen, brothers and sisters. We don't really need to write you for you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return, when you hear the word day of the Lord, that's the time when he's coming back. The day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. When people are saying everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin, and there will be no escape. But you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. Any of us here should not be surprised. That day's going to come on the rest of the world, and it'll be like a thief broke into a house at night when no one was awake, no one was looking, no one was watching. 
How many of you have ever been broken into your home or your car? I can't tell you, a couple of times in my driveway, I have forgot to lock my car, and I'll walk out and I'll see the console between the, between the seats up. Have you ever experienced something like that? And it's just like this flush feeling like somebody's invaded my space. What is it going to be like after Jesus returns and people are left? This is, this is the thing. But he said, for you, don't be surprised. You won't be surprised. For you are all children of the light and of the day. We don't belong to darkness and night. So be on guard, not asleep like the others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. That's good advice. That's good wisdom. Here's what I bring into you today. Be alert. Stay alert. Be watching. Be ready. The Bible gives us signs to look for in the times that we live in. The scripture says it's the last days. It's going gonna, it's gonna to look a little bit odd. It's going to look a little bit strange. The disciples were saying, what is the sign of your return? What is the sign of the end of the world? And Jesus lists several things for us uh, to look for of what's going to take place. The Bible says in the last days, it's, it's going to be difficult times. In the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth. People won't listen to sound teaching. They'll, they'll be out looking for teachers who will, who will say whatever their itching ears want to hear. Jesus gave us warning signs. We know, we know warning signs. We know things like just yesterday at noon, it reminded me as I'm studying, the sirens go off here, tornado sirens at noon on the first Saturday of every month. So yesterday, how many of you heard the sirens? Okay, some of you weren't even paying attention. Sirens are going off. They're testing the system. How many of you, I mean, it, it, when, when I hear the sirens going off on a, on a sunny fall Saturday, and the sirens are going, it's, it's, it's not that ominous. But when the skies are dark, and the, and the clouds are, are kind of swirling in the sky, and you hear thunder and lightning, and you start to hear those sirens go off, that's a little bit eerie. But it's a warning sign saying something is to come. Danger is ahead. And that's what Jesus really is just giving us those warning signs. Meteorologists, they're constantly improving their equipment and they've done a better job, whether it's uh, hurricanes or tornadoes or whatever, predicting of impending danger. So as people of God, it's important that we watch for the signs, that we are aware of the times that we live in so that we will be prepared spiritually for what is to come in the future. The Bible is an amazing book that accurately describes future events. It has to this point. Prophecies of the Bible that were given thousands of years ago and we see those things begin to come to pass. How in the world could a book predict those things? With accuracy. It should cause us to take notice. The Bible speaks about Israel, about Messiah, and also about the end times. 27% of your Bible is prophetic. Most of that is concerning the end times. Jesus scolded the religious leaders of his day not, for not recognizing the, the biblical signs that were there. It was momentous times that they were living in, and Messiah was right there in front of them, and they didn't even recognize him. This is what Jesus said to them. You know the saying, red sky at night means um, fair weather tomorrow. Red sky in the morning means foul weather all day. You know how to interpret the weather signs in the sky, but you don't know how to interpret the signs of the times. We need to be watching more than just the weather. There's a biblical principle of cause and effect. It's, it's, it's about sowing and reaping. And the Bible tells us many times that we will reap whatever we sow. Many scriptures highlight this truth that obeying God brings blessings, but disobeying God brings curses. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 28. God said, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep all of his commands that I'm giving you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the world. You will experience all these blessings if you obey the Lord. But then verse 15 goes on to say, if you refuse to listen and don't obey the commands and decrees, and there's a long list of curses. In the time of Noah, we see this as a, a powerful example. 
Genesis chapter 6. Creation happened in the first two chapters. Genesis 6. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart were only evil all the time. Things had gotten bad in a hurry. Their disobedience caused a lot of pain and suffering. And the scripture tells us that God was sorry that he had even made man. It broke his heart and he decided to start over. And we know that story of the flood and Noah and his family. Jesus gives this warning of the end times in Matthew chapter 24 later on. In verse 37 he says, When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in the days of Noah. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up into the time that Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Today, we can see that our opinions about sin, our views of sin have changed and are continually changing in our culture and in our world and not for the better. How many of you would agree? Things that were recognized as wrong in the past are increasingly accepted, whether that be premarital sex or lying, cheating, stealing, swearing, lusting, homosexuality, the list goes on and on. Jesus warned that we shouldn't become apathetic and accepting of sin, like in Noah's day. And I want to just briefly today touch on several of the signs because the signs are there. The signs are warning us of Jesus' eminent return. And by eminent, I mean it could be tomorrow. It could be today. It might not be till next week. He could wait that long. <laughs> it may not even be next year. It may not be in my lifetime or your lifetime. But we have no idea Jesus has given us the signs, and I think the signs tell us that we are in the ballpark, so to speak. And so my intention this morning is not to go in depth on these signs, but just to make you aware of what we're facing and what our response should be. The first thing, and this doesn't come from Matthew 24, but I think it's the first thing that we look at, and that is Israel. Israel is a sign that we need to look for. Israel that became a nation in 1948. If you missed the message last week from Pastor Weaver, you can go back and see the history of what God and how God has brought the the nation of Israel and the Jewish people along. But God's promise to to, um, Abraham was to make him into a great nation. I will bless you, and you will be a blessing to others, and I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse those who treat you with contempt. 2,500 years they were scattered before they came back as a nation together. Fulfilling the prophecy that they would become a nation in one day. This small little nation, smaller than the size of the state of New Jersey. This most contested piece of real estate in the world. In the world. Israel's been a nation now for 75 years. They're a significant part of the end times. We need to keep our eye on Israel and know what the scriptures say. Jesus said in in verse 6 and 7 of Matthew 24, he said, you will hear of wars and threats of wars. But he said, don't panic, because these these things must take place. But the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Listen, there's been wars from the very beginning, right? War has been happening all along. Just wars is not the sign, but it's the frequency, it's the intensity. In the last century, we endured two world wars. And I'm sure if you lived through those, some of you in the room uh, may have lived through one of those for sure. If you lived during that time, you may be thinking at the same time, is this the end? The current event that's going on in the Middle East with Hamas and Hezbollah and Israel and all the countries that are lining themselves up on either side, which is kind of lopsided is what it's looking. Uh, I don't think this is going to end soon, but we need to keep our eye on what's going on. There's a great war that will end, be the end of all wars, and the Bible talks about the Battle of Armageddon, and we know the outcome of that that Jesus wins. Praise the Lord. He talks about natural disasters. Verse 7 speaks of famine and earthquakes in many parts 
of the world. Not only do we have famine and earthquakes, we've got hurricanes and severe storms, flooding, fires, pestilence, diseases, pandemics, and drought. Those flood the news, the, the news stories. Maybe some of you don't watch the news anymore, but I can tell you that's, that's the kind of things that they're talking about, and the frequency and the intensity of those things are growing. Jesus said in verse 8, this is only the first signs of birth pains. There will be more to come. I read an article this week that just last year in, in 2022, there were $18 billion disaster events where they paid out more than a billion dollars, 18 of those in, in the world. So when we liken it to birth pains, we're talking about greater intensity and uh, greater frequency and stronger intensity. Number four, Jesus talks about persecution, persecution of believers. That has been happening since the beginning. Of Jesus, since the beginning, when Jesus was here on earth, he was persecuted. He said, "Just as I am persecuted, you're going to be persecuted too." So we have persecution from the time of Peter and Paul through the book of Acts. But here's what we can say: persecution of Christians. And Jewish people around the world are at an all-time high and becoming worse. It's the frequency and the intensity of things, these things happening. Countries with the greatest persecution. I came across something this week uh, by an organization called Open Doors. And they listed the top 50 nations in the world uh, that are persecuted. And if you take these 50 nations, last Sunday night, if you weren't here uh, you missed an incredible presentation on uh, ministry to Pakistan. Pakistanis are coming to Christ in a nation that's 98% Muslim. They're number seven on the most persecuted countries in the world. Out of those top 50 nations with persecution, 312 million Christians face very high or extreme levels of persecution. Just this past Wednesday in my Wednesday night Bible study, we have a lady that is there. And she may be here this morning from Eritrea. Some of you have never heard of that country before, but it's in East Africa on the coast. It's telling that there are pastors in Eritrea who have been in prison for the last 20 years. We haven't known persecution like that in America, but some countries in the world experience that on the regular, whether they're from Nations in Africa or China or places in the Middle East, you can see that list. It's pretty, pretty incredible. But this is what Jesus said, a sign of the end times. You will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You'll be hated all over the world because you're my followers. Peter said this in 1 Peter three fourteen: If you suffer for doing what is right, God will bless you for it. It's not called suffering if you're paying the price for your own stupid mistakes. But if you're suffering for the sake of Christ... And I say all this to say, listen, we need to be ready, and the, the time for us to think about this is now before it happens. Because if you wait until all of a sudden someone's at your door to arrest you, now what's going to happen? Get a plan in your head already ahead of time, what's going to happen? I don't know that we're not going to have that kind of persecution here, but here's what's going to happen. With that, a lot of people are going to fall away. But here's what I can tell you too, this testimony of the pastors who have been in prison for 20 plus years... That country is experiencing revival in the underground church. Where persecution is the greatest is where the gospel is the most prolific. So am I so sad that, that persecution could come here? Absolutely not. It's time for us to get serious in our faith and stand up for what we believe in and stop living in a fantasy world. Jesus talks about false prophets. There's not much to say, but the internet gives them a huge voice in our world. Rampant sin. Listen, we know what sin is. And we know what rampant means, right? This is what Jesus said, there will be rampant sin and lawlessness. It will increase to such proportions that the love of many will grow cold. Let me ask you, are you seeing growing lawlessness and growing and rampant sin in our world today? I don't even have to talk about murder and drugs and pornography and pedophilia and sex traffic and, and riots and protests and looting and crime and transgenderism and whatever else. I don't have to talk about any of that. 
He said the gospel will spread. The gospel will spread. Where persecution is, the gospel is spreading. But with the internet and with cell phones and with technology, it's easy to see how the gospel can go to the ends of the earth. He said when it is preached to the whole world, then the end will come. Economy is something that people talk about a lot. One world economy, one world government. The Bible doesn't talk about that, really. We make that inference in the time of the Antichrist and the tribulation. We know that there's coming a time during that time with the Antichrist, during the tribulation, that everyone will be required great and small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or the forehead where no one can buy or sell without that mark. The Bible says it's either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. I don't know if you know this, but in Sweden this year, in March, they went completely cashless, only digital in Sweden. There's a company that uh, just in January of this year, uh, they hit the 50,000 mark of people who are chipped in their hand. And the way they pay for their groceries is, you know, the little tap thing with your credit card? They just tap their hand and, and away you go. For only $300, you could be chipped in your hand. I don't know what to say about all that. I'm not telling you what my opinion is on all of that. Because I really don't know. But it's kind of scary when the Bible talks about no one will be able to buy or sell unless they have a mark on their hand or in their forehead it's getting close. I hope that doesn't scare you. It shouldn't at all. The Bible gives us warning signs. Second Timothy, chapter three. You should know this, Timothy, Paul's telling him. In the last days, there will be very difficult times where people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving, unforgiving. They will slander others, have no self-control. They'll be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. Does that sound like our world today? I believe that the end times are near. I'm not saying that they're here, but they're near, and we need to be ready. This is the message today. Get right with God. Stay right with God. Get a backbone. Stand up for what's right and what's true and make sure your heart is always right with God. Don't be one of the statistics of the Bible of those who fall away. Determine today that you're going to live for God. Your life and your children's life and your grandchildren's life depend on it. Your neighbors, your co-workers, the people that you rub shoulders with, they need you. If you're not going to stand, how are they ever going to have a chance? We need to have our bags packed, so to speak, and our hearts prepared. Listen, you look outside right now, and I can tell you that the signs of fall are upon us. I'm not weird in saying that, am I? No, the leaves are turning colors. The leaves are falling from the trees. The temperatures are getting cooler. The days are getting shorter. Just last night, we got an extra hour of sleep because our, our clocks fell back an hour. How many of you got an extra hour? That's why most of you aren't sleeping. Thank you. <laughs> we know that fall is here, and whether you're ready or not, like it or not, snow is coming. I knew there would be a few applauses. Winter is just around the corner. You know why? Because we see the signs. What are the signs telling us spiritually about what's going on in the world? That time is getting near. Time is getting near. So get your heart right with God. Listen, he didn't give us these things to scare us, but to prepare us. We've got the, we've got the cheat sheet. He gave us the answers ahead of time. He just didn't put dates on it, which is for our benefit. Because some of you would just act crazy until then, and then who knows what would happen to you. He's given us the signs so that we know the times. Knowing what's next prepares us for what is right now. 
Some of you yesterday were out chopping things out of your flower beds. You were getting the hoses off your house. You were getting the, the snowblower out and primed up and ready to run. I mean, you're doing all these things because why? The signs are telling you snow could happen anytime. Get ready. Put the mower away. Get the snowblower out. It's important for us to see the signs of the times, to tune into what God's word says and understand what's going on around us and put it all into context. God's given us these signs, like I said, not to scare us, but to prepare us. We need to be alert. We need to be ready. We need to be watching. We need to be waiting. We need to be patient with anticipation because we have no idea what time he's going to show up. I'm going to ask the musicians if they would come. I want to tell you this. Our lives are going to be dominated by the problems that we see. They'll be dominated by the problems that we see or the promises that we trust. You can be fearful about the things that you see going on around you, the problems, or you can experience peace because of the promises of God's word that you've come to know and you've come to trust and to know that he is a faithful God who will be faithful to you to the very end, that he's never gonna leave you, he's not gonna forsake you, he's not gonna go put you through something that he's not gonna go with you through it. He's not, you're not gonna experience a time when you're, so far away from God, if you reach out to him and draw near to him. This is a message as a kid that I would hear over and over and over again, and I would think to myself, they talk about Jesus coming all the time. But where is he? Fast forward 40 years in the future. We don't talk about his coming as much as we used to. Jesus said in a time when you least expect in a time when people are partying and marrying and buying and selling and doing all these things, it's gonna catch people unaware. But I don't want any of us to be unaware. That time could come any moment. Jesus follows up this Matthew 24 with a parable about the 10 virgins. You know that story, they were going to the wedding, the bridegroom was there, there were 10 of them, they had their lamps, five of them had extra oil, five of them didn't have enough oil. And when it came time and they heard that the bridegroom was coming, the ones that didn't have oil said to the ones that did have oil, hey, can we borrow just a little bit? And what did they say? I'm not missing this, I've been waiting all this time and you're not gonna, you're not gonna mess me up and, and miss this. Go buy some at the store and hurry back here. So that's what they did. They took off and came back and the door was shut. And as they knocked on the door, listen to what, listen to what was told them. While they were gone to buy the oil, the bridegroom came, those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast and the door was locked. Later, when the other five brides, bridesmaids returned, They stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch for you don't know the hour of my return. Would you bow your heads with me? Here's what I want to know. Are you you ready? Is your heart right with God? Is your family right with God? It's a simple message, simple to respond. God, I don't want to miss you. I don't want to miss anything. I want to be ready. Whatever happens, whatever I face, whatever I go through, every day when I wake up my head, wake, pick up my head off the pillow, I want to say, is this the day? Is this the day that it's going to happen? Every night when I lay my head on the pillow, 
can I say, mm, is, is tonight the night when it could happen? It needs to be on the forefront of our mind. We need to be watching, we need to be waiting, and we need to be ready. If there's anyone in the room today and you're not sure that you're ready, if Jesus were to come today, if Jesus were to come today and he didn't find you ready, and half of the room, listen, here's the sad part of that, that parable. That parable wasn't to the world, it was to the church. Half of them didn't make it. I'm not saying that parable is a prophetic, but here's what I'm saying. I don't want any of you to miss it. Let's get right with God. If today you're, you want to be sure, you're not sure, and you're saying, I want to be sure that I'm right with God, that my sins are forgiven, that I'm in a right place with God, and that if he returns, if Jesus comes back, I'm going with him. I want to be ready. Just raising your hand today, say, Pastor Jeff, I want to pray to know that I'm ready. Don't be ashamed. Listen, this isn't just get out of hell ticket. This is knowing I'm going to heaven and the confidence and the assurance of that. Anybody else, raise your hand. Cross the room. Jesus, would you just join me in a prayer? Many hands in the room, just join me in this prayer. Jesus, let's all just pray this prayer together. Jesus, thank you for caring for me and loving me and dying for me to pay the price for my sin. Cleanse me, purify me, make me whole and right with you. I accept you as Lord and Savior of my life. Change me. Make me new. And make me ready. In Jesus' name. And I don't want any one of us to miss this. Stuff is going on in the world, and I'm, I, I know it can be frightful. And some of you stopped watching the news long ago because it's just you don't know what to believe and and not believe. Here's what I here's what I can say. Don't act like nothing's going on because it is. It's all going on. But every day's an adventure. I read an article this week of a guy who who was called to ministry, went to um, oh what's that college in Chicago, Moody Bible Institute. The big evangelical, like going into ministry, and then he went to Princeton and decided he he decided that the Bible's all a hoax. And they were talking about how laughable it is that Christians can have such joy with all the garbage that's going on in the world. And they're all excited that the world's going to end like this. No, I'm not excited that the world's going to end like this. But I'm so happy that Jesus saw me ahead of time and took care of things for me so that I could be with him forever in heaven. Would you stand with me? We were going to sing this song. I'm going to have you respond today, but I talked, talk, talk. I'm not feeling the best today. I should have said that ahead of time, but you guys would have just checked out on me. So pray for me. But I want to see all of us. One by one. I've been doing a lot of funerals like... I, 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 I don't really like funerals, but here's the thing. I love that we can tell the message of Jesus and what Jesus has done and how this person followed Jesus and we can talk about their hope and their faith. And that's what I want to preach at your funeral too. I want to be able to say, this, is, this person lived by faith. Let's follow their example. Let's, let's, let's go the way that they're going. And let's, one by one, we just gather on the other side and we can have this in a few years, in heaven, a perfect place. I'm going there. And I want you to go too. Our mission is to go to heaven and take as many people with us as we possibly can. Let's not just make it. Let's take an army of people with us. Amen. Let's just close with this song that just says, I'm going to make room. I'm going to have Pastor Austin close this.